books bail it down the street with the brim pool way down low. Ain't no sound but the sound of his feet. Machine guns ready to go. Are you ready? Hey, are you ready for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the door with the bullets rip to the sound of the beat. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one gone, and another one gone, and another one bites the dust. Yeah. Hey, gonna get you too. Another one bites the dust. Bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Hey, hey! Another one bites the dust. The how? Another one bites the dust. Yeah. everybody i hope you enjoyed that i sure as heck did working with those wonderful musicians really means a lot to me obviously first of all thank you mr mark martell mark and i actually um completed an ep together a christmas ep i'll put a link to that underneath also chris lipe who has that incredible vocal channel who we've collaborated a lot with and myself flew to nashville and worked with Mark for a week, and we came up with an incredible vocal course, an amazing vocal course. So keep a look out for that. You can, of course, go and download these multi-tracks, which we're about to talk about. And of course, you can opt in and sign up for more information about Mark's incredible course. Mark is one of the best singers I've ever worked with, by far. On the EP that he and I did together, I did not and I repeat, did not tune a single note. Nope. We can have our friend Phil at Wings of Pegasus go through and actually check that out, and you'll know there is none of this stuff going on. Mark is a phenomenal singer. He's super humble. And of course, he is blessed with a voice that can very easily is the wrong word, but can sound a lot like who I consider to be the greatest rock singer that ever lived, Mr. Freddie Mercury. Well, I'm not alone. Many of you consider Freddie Mercury to be the greatest rock singer that ever lived. So what I want to do now is go through the mix and talk a little bit about the recording. So 
We have Pete Riley on drums. Pete is an absolutely fantastic drummer. So if you watch yesterday's video on Another One Bites the Dust on the recording of the original, that was Pete who broke down how he played the parts, how Roger originally performed the parts. So let's have a listen to the drums in solo. I have honestly found over the years that a four on the floor groove is what separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls when it comes to drumming, to be quite frank. I've worked with a lot of really well-known drummers that cannot play a four on the floor steadily. That relationship between the kick and the snare hitting at the right time is imperative that it feels correct. If it's too early, it's terrible. If it's too late, it's terrible. It just has to land in the perfect feel. And Pete is a great, great drummer who's really managed to nail that groove. So on the kick in, I've done two things. I've actually exaggerated here some 60 hertz, pulled down some 92, which is where the bass guitar is sitting, and then pulled out a lot of 350. I didn't do any additional high-end boost because the kick itself has a lot of high-end in it. Have a listen. So it really was just a case of cutting out an area for the bass guitar to live and then an area of low mid that was just muddy. Now the kick out, I didn't do any EQ2 at all, and this is what you get. And it's all thump. So the sound is the two blended together. There's one little minor thing I did, and that is I dragged back the kick in. So if you have a look here, it's poor, it's it's slightly early the kick in because, of course, the kick out mic is on the outside. So I measured about 145 samples, I believe, at the end of the day, 130, 140. And so I've got a time adjuster, 145. Now, you can do that with a fancy plugin if you want to time align the kicks together, whatever you want to do. I just do it by using a time adjuster plugin. Those two kick elements are going into an EQ that's cutting, again, some 350 area. And that's the Mac DSP EQ, which I absolutely love. So many of us love the filter bank. It's just a really good sounding EQ. And then I'm boosting some 60 hertz there. And then I've got another API, no boost on the high end at all, but some cut at 400 and quite a decent amount of boost at 50 hertz. And then the last EQ, I did a little extra cut at 80 and a little at 100 here just to let the bass guitar sit in there. And I actually did some high passing at 36. And the reason why I did that is that enormous amount of 50 and 60 boost I was doing was fantastic at 50 or 60, but the buildup was getting a little bit too much and the low lows. So all of that together gives you this. Now, despite the fact that the original Queen drums were recorded super, super dead, I am putting a tiny amount of ambience on it. That's because in the digital world, you want something to have no ambience. You can do it perfectly. You can gate, you can draw it out, you can use fancy tools to remove it. And even though the Queen drums are dead, they weren't so dead that there wasn't some kind of ambience around it. So I do actually have a little bit of a kick room. It's set very, very quiet. So it's at minus 23 dB. I also made it only mid-range, so no high end and no low lows to get in the way of the kick drum. I just did the Abbey Road trick, so I used an EQ here before going into a stock standard, three quarters of a second, Digirack Diverb. This is old school, <laughs> comes with free with your DAW. Snare, top and bottom. The EQ is boosting here. And I'm basically just going to 123 hertz, so 120, and just boosting it quite dramatically and a little bit of high-end boost. And that's true for both the bottom and the top of the snare. They both got the same EQ on it. I'm adding a little bit more body. And that is going into a snare master, which has got a high-end lift and a bit more low-end boost. Now, the only thing I'm doing is I've actually got a snare sample, but have a listen to it. If you can barely hear that, that's because you can barely hear it. And I'm using that to trigger a little tiny bit of verb, but put all three elements together. 
take that sample out. Back in. Out. In. I just put it in there for a little tiny bit of mid-range ring. In the original Queen one, it's actually very EQ'd. Like, very EQ'd. It sounds like they've gone to the console and just boosted the mid-range really dramatically. I hear a lot of, like, 1.5. You know, I hear sort of a mid-range area on what sounds like an EVQ to me, really pushed up on the snare, with the body as well. But I, that, if you want to add more of that in, you could use the sample, which, of course, we're going to give you. Now, there's a second snare. If you watch Pete playing in the video, you'll see him go over to the right a little bit more because he's left-handed, so... His snares are set up over on this side, on the right-hand side, not the left-hand side. So he's got a hat here and snare there. He plays left-handed drummer. And that second snare has zero EQ on it. Basically, this is the snare sound. That's it. I didn't do any EQ on it at all. All the snares and the kick, and we get this. The only thing I did is on that second snare, I did boost it in volume a bit, just so it cuts a little bit because it makes sense in it. Then we have a hi-hat mic, no EQ. Overheads have a little bit of high passing, a little bit of low mid cut, which is about 289, so about 300. And then a gentle high pass starting at about 130, 140. So, but with the hi-hat with no EQ, And then the room mics, I didn't do any work to. I had lots of fun things on them. I did originally have a longer reverb on it, but then when I realized I wanted the drum sound to be dry, I didn't do it at all. So here's all the mics together. Now with Tony's bass, if you watch yesterday's video, Tony talks about the fact that he just used a DI only, which we did as well, but we duplicated the DI and one half of the DI is all the low end like this. So I'm high passing at 63, but then I'm low passing at 210. So I've got this kind of blob of low end on this one. And then the second half, which is the duplicated, is the opposite. So at 240 here, it's high passed. And then there's a boost at about, you know, usually about 3K for me for fingers. To put the two together and you get this. So you get a controllable fader of low end and then a controllable fader of mid range. So we got some gentle compression, which is barely doing anything here. Then we have an REQ, and this is where it gets more dramatic because what I'm doing is I'm controlling the low end, which seems quite harsh at the moment because I got it at 66 on a high pass, but you're going to see why I do that in a second. But then I'm boosting the mid range at 750 here and 350 there. So that gives you that nosy, if I turn it off, bring it on. Off. So, off. On. So, that is going into an R bass. So, what I like to do is I like to control the low end going into the bass boost. Because if I give it too much, the way that the R bass works is it, it boosts the 80, but it also pulls up a lot a below and a lot above it. So I like to shape what it's boosting. It controls it a little bit more. Otherwise, if you just boost 80, it's just too much. Then my old favorite, and I think is an essential for a great bass, even bass tone is the MV2. I mean, it just locks the bass into place. So it takes the low volume information and the high volume information and squashes it together. So the dynamic range is reduced on the bass. But in this instance, that's what we want. We want a really controlled, mid-rangey bass tone. So let's throw that in with the drums, and we get this. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there's one last thing I must add that I did after the MV2, after listening to it, the drums, is I did an additional boost of those mid range areas here. So I really went to town on it to kind of give that mid range honkiness that you hear in the original track. So Jamie Humphreys, the great Jamie Humphreys from Six String Alliance, who plays guitar for Brian May and many, many other people, wonderful guitar player, played the guitars on this. Now, Jamie recorded this as a stereo track, and I'm going to give it to you as a stereo track, but you could use one of these elements of this one in mono. He gave it to us as stereo, but it's pretty identical. This is the, the funky part that John played along with his own bass line. So he plays the bass line, and then he doubles it with the electric guitar. And just like the original, you can really hear that, pat, 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 that spanky compression. Put the drums in. Just really fantastic. Now, the thing about Jamie's tone, as you can hear there, the reason why I didn't do any EQ or compression is because he got the sound like the record because that's what he does. So it is a version of the record. All right, next up is some of the stereo stuff, which could be Brian because it sounds very Brian with the heavy parts. It might be John. But it definitely sounds like Brian's playing the heavy parts in this. And of course, all of the bridge stuff is also Brian as well. And again, no EQ, no compression. That's how Jamie did it. Jamie spent the time and the energy doing the best he could to match it. Right, next up is, of course, John Deacon's funky guitar part. You'll notice all of that reverb, all of that tone is printed on it. One more time. So in theory, you could put that into the track if you've done some EQ and compression on the drums and the bass and just use those guitars as is. Here is all those elements together. All right, so what else are we hearing there? Well, we're hearing me, and <laughs> it's not tuned, not timed. This is me singing in solo. It's probably quite scary, but here it is. Another one bites the dust, and another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust. Hey, I'm going to get you too, another one bites the dust. And, and then I go up in pitch on these ones here. Another one bites the dust. Hey, I'm gonna get you too. Another one bites the dust. Great. So Mark recorded all of that on his Townsend mic. We went to Blackbird Studios, as I said, a few weeks ago, and we lined up everything, every single freaking mic you can think of, and we did a shootout. And it kept coming back to this pristine, perfect condition U47. We thought a C12 or a C12A was going to work because, of course, Freddie famously in many, many videos is singing into a C12A. So we were like, maybe with Mark's tone being similar to Freddie's, it would work on that. And it ended up being a 47. And when he came back here, we used the 47 when we were working on his solo record on his Christmas EP. In the meantime, we did get to check out the Townsend and use a 47 emulation on that that was superb. So he ended up buying the Townsend, which of course now is the UAD Townsend microphone. And that's what we cut all these vocals on. Now for Mark, it's a little darker, but we're using an Arvox here. Another one bites the dust, and another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust. So first of all, we have a vocal rider. So if I go to a quiet part, like here. Another one bites the dust. 
That's why it's working. It's not really there on the loud parts. I've just got it so it brings up some of the quieter parts. It's a fun plugin. Love it all the time. Now, as far as the EQ is concerned, I've got a bit of high passing here just to get rid of low end I don't need. A tiny bit of boost here. A compressor, the first compressor I'm using is an is an R comp, a Renaissance compressor by Waves. Another one bites the dust. I got a decent amount of compression going on. And another one gone, and another one gone, and another one bites the dust yet. Probably about 2 dB. But remember, on the original vocal itself, there is an R Vox, which I usually get quite a lot of gain reduction. And another one gone, and another one gone. That's just about 2 to 3 dB. So, so far we have 2 to 3 dB on the Arvox on the initial vocal, and then we have the, the vocal rider on just the quiet stuff, turning it up a couple of dB, but only on the quiet stuff. Then we have an R comp doing another 2 to 3 dB with the game reduction. So, total, we've got maybe on the quieter stuff, boosting with the vocal rider, but probably about five on average dB worth of gain reduction total on it. But I'm really big on using different style of compressors with an incremental reduction. That's a big deal. You probably hear a lot of mixers talk about that, but I think that's a way to go, especially if you do like EQ into compression and then EQ into compression, EQ into compression, using it in small kind of amounts gives you something really, really great. Then, of course, I'm doing my vocal distortion trick where I'm using the lo-fi plugin. I've got a vocal octave in there using a pitch change, and I've got a whisper track, which is the Mofoda. Now, none of these are particularly loud, but they are all in there to give you this vocal sound. And another one gone, and another one gone, and another one bites the dust, yeah. Hey, gonna get you to another one bites the dust. Now, I've got the vocal thickening trick, which is, of course, the H3000 that we use where we go detune up and down. Here it is. So what it's doing is it's delaying the signal ever so slightly, like ever so slightly, but then it's pitch changing. And I usually go about three cents up, three cents down, six cents up, six cents down, nine cents up, nine cents down. But I pan them opposite. So it's not all flat on one side and sharp on the other. I go flat, sharp, you know, flat, sharp. So I go opposite each other. So it creates a light chorusing, very controlled. And because I'm using the H3000, the Eventide H3000, which is an absolutely incredible unit. I mean, everything Eventide, you've probably seen recently there's been I wouldn't say renaissance or renaissance, whatever you want to say, in Eventide, but there's definitely been a huge, you know, a, a lot of us, not just guys like me have been, you, you know, mixing for 20, 25 years, but a lot of the younger guys and girls are coming up are discovering just how good Eventide stuff is. The fact that they have this legacy of building units from the 70s, and they have been at the forefront of digital technology for decades. They were the first to make some of the best sounding equipment. And here they are now with plugins doing it still to this day. Huge fan. And I'm not alone, which is great. Okay. Um, yeah, then you split EQ is just superb. And I love the fact that all of these great young YouTubers are coming out all loving what they're doing. And that's very gratifying. Okay. So then I have two prints for you, which are actually from my Lexicon PCM90 which is barely audible. So I don't even know, but they're there if you want to use them. <laughs> I just played them. And then I've got uh, a bit of a reverb. I've got, well, let's, we can go through and, and have a listen. I've got reverbs galore. How do you think I'm gonna get along without you and your gunner? So much grit in his voice. How do you think I'm gonna get along without you and your gunner? So I've got like a one and a half second um, room there. I've got a slap delay. I've got a plate here, which is set a little bit longer. That's set for like 3.8 seconds, basically. Then I've got a very short, like a tiled room, which is set at 0.65. And then probably most importantly, I've got Echo Boy twice. I've got one a quarter note and one an eighth note, and it's set to the BPM of the song. The point is, is like this song really isn't at a BPM. It's, it, it, I know it was originally looped, but when you load it back into a DAW, it doesn't have a consistent tempo. It does have a tempo that that fluctuates X number of bars, but it's not on a grid. It is Roger Taylor playing a groove, which they then looped. It's not 
a bar lute. It's, I don't know what it is, 16 bars maybe? It's definitely quite a long loop. And even though this is a live drum performance that we did, we cut it to the original performance. So it should be the original tempo of the original song. All right, I think you have all the moments. Let's put it all together now and give it a listen. Walks barely down the street with the brim pool way down low. Ain't no sound but the sound of his feet. Machine guns ready to go. Are you ready? Hey, are you better for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the door where the bullets rip to the sound of the beat. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one gone, and another one gone, and another one bites the dust, yeah. Hey, gonna get you to another one bites the dust. So it's cool. As long as my backgrounds are sort of just loud enough to be in the right place, but not too loud, it works. Obviously, I'm nowhere near as good a singer as Mark. And if you solo my vocals, you can hear how untuned they are. But I did four. And sometimes that's the beauty, just do four vocals. I didn't time them, I didn't vocal line them, I didn't tune them. If you put them too loud, they are not going to work. But if you put them in just the right place, they're gonna work really, really well. So you can go and download these multitracks. Not only can you download the multitracks, you can also learn more about Mark's course. You can put in your email address and we will send you details on Mark's vocal course. It is absolutely superb. And we did it with Chris Lipe, who knows his onions. When it comes to vocals, Chris is the man. All right, everybody, thank you ever so much for watching. Please don't forget to download the multi-tracks, find out more about Mark's course, and have a marvelous time recording and mixing. I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, adios, tschüss, sayonara, goodbye.